The patrons have spoken and they've chosen Stoutwin. This good dog first became known to fans in Generation 5, probably when battling Lenora, who Stoutlin destroyed pretty much anything on its first turn with Retaliate, and was plenty difficult to deal with afterwards too. Stoutlin also deserves all the Poké Treats in the world because it selflessly rescues people lost in the mountains, even in blizzards, thanks to its simply excellent fur. The question how good a dog was Stoutlin actually just can't be answered with words. It's that good. Instead, today we'll be examining how Stoutlin performed in the comparatively cutthroat competitive scene. And so, we ask, how good was Stoutlin actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Stoutland stands out next to the other normal types thanks to one of its abilities being none other than Sand Rush. Now, a Pokemon called Excadrill also possessed this ability and terrorized Gen 5 OU right from day one, so there wasn't exactly room for Stoutland and OU. But what about UU? Well, there was no way Tyranitar was dropping to UU either, so there was the problem of it not having a Sand Setter. Oh wait, never mind, because none other than the mighty Hippowdon appeared in UU as well, and a beautiful partnership was formed. To say the two were effective would be an understatement. Sand teams came to utterly dominate and completely define the metagame. In fact, one can make the argument that the UU Hippo Stoutland core was more devastating than OU's Tyranitar Extra Drill combo. How can that be? Well, Excadrill, of course, was one of the most absurdly broken Pokemon to ever touch an OU metagame, but Tyranitar was far from it. Meanwhile, in UU, it wasn't just that Stoutland Sand rushed to a similarly overpowered position, because it did, but also that Hippowdon was pretty broken itself. This made the two doubly lethal and led to their stranglehold on the tier. Stoutland outsped and ripped through most teams, save for Rocks and Steels, who, like much of the rest of the metagame, were walled by Hippowdon. These Rocks and Steels didn't have recovery and would get worn down switching into Stoutland with hazards up repeatedly. So with the effortless longevity Hippo provided Stoutland's team, outlasting Stoutland's few checks was incredibly easy. But wait, you might wonder. UU wasn't exactly a frail tier. It resembled Gen 4 OU after all, which had plenty of naturally bulky Pokemon like Suicune and Zapdos, plus Stoutland's base 100 attack that wasn't exactly the stuff of legend. So how was it regularly slicing through teams? Simple, if you didn't resist it, you were taking a lot of damage from stab choice ban return, and most Pokemon didn't resist it. To illustrate this concept, Bold Suicune, one of the bulkiest Pokemon in the game, took a whopping 37% minimum from return, and at max 43%. So pretty much everything else was getting absolutely crushed. That wasn't all though. Stoutland was backed by a gauntlet of passive damage, which quickly exacerbated its already hard-hitting return. Turn. Stealth Rock and Sandstorm in and of themselves already had a significant crippling effect. Sand at worst nullified leftovers, at best adding another 6% to Stoutland's damage output, while rocks piled it on. However, that wasn't all. One of the best Pokemon on Sand teams was Roserade. Its ability to dominate bulky waters was always key for such teams, but it's what it did once it hit the field that really pushed Stoutland from dangerous to downright ludicrous. Roserade spikes that made Stoutland even more impossible to deal with for anything that wasn't a dedicated check, while all also ensuring that even Stoutland's dedicated checks, like Rhyperior, would be worn down and thus outlasted. Despite not being rock, steel, or ground, Stoutland itself wasn't affected by sand thanks to Sand Rush. As such, it was nearly impossible to withstand repeated bludgeoning from Stoutland. Hippowdon itself was a decent Stoutland check between a Suicune S bulk, instant recovery, resistance to Stealth Rock, and immunity to Sandstorm. This longevity was key, but Hippowdon was also, of course, forced to slack off when switching into Stoutland, which gave the Stout user a free switch to Rose Raid, which would scare out Hippo and lay down spikes, and those spikes would eventually make it impossible for even Hippowdon to withstand Stoutland. Funnily enough, the fact that Hippo was able to withstand the immensely broken Stoutland was particularly indicative of its own brokenness. That, and the fact that it effortlessly facilitated Stoutland. For this broken double whammy, Hippowdon was banned, so did Stoutland slow down? Not in the slightest! The player base knew how obscene it was, and thus facilitated it through Eviolite Hippopotas. Their Hippo was was no longer broken, but their dog certainly was. Even without the endlessly walling ability of Hippowdon backing it up, Stoutland was still utterly ridiculous. Eventually, the player base had had enough, and a Stoutland Ravage UU tier finally banned Sandstream in its entirety. With no sandless viability in UU or any tiers below, Stoutland disappeared from sight for a while. It saw some use on OU Sand teams, but it was quite niche overall. Until Black and White 2 came around. It gaining superpower in Black and White 2 was helpful. 
helping it both revenge kill huge threats like Terrakion and Kirin Black, as well as threatening would-be walls to its normal stab, such as Ferrothorn, Heatran, and Tyranitar. But that wasn't what launched Stoutland's niche. The previously popular Sand Balance team struggled to keep up against the onslaught of the new wall breakers that rejuvenated fast-paced offense, and then Stoutland appeared. In the spirit of its predecessor, Extra it provided a tremendous revenge killer against all sorts of threats, from Keldeo to Volcarona, and an excellent late-game cleaner. This was enormous for Sand Balances, as it allowed them to be able to keep up with these aggressive, fast-paced offenses. It effectively put them on a timer, as they only had so long before they'd be weakened enough to get cleaned up by banded returns. It reunited with its old partner, Hippowdon, and their dynamic was similar to the one they had in Yuyu. Hippowdon's walling prowess was not as all-encompassing in the more powerful OU, but it was massively helpful in drawing the game out and wearing down the opposing team into Stoutland range. It was a specific niche, but it was a legitimate one that helped propel Sand Balance back into the metagame. Sadly, eventually the one and only Excadro came back, and Stoutland disappeared from OU. Then Sand Rush Excadro proved to be overpowered even when not used on Sand teams because of how good it was against Sand, and the Sand Rush ability was banned in its entirety, removing any chance for Stoutland to come back. Some players who liked Stoutland's place in the metagame clamored for the rules to be shifted so that it could still be used, but alas, to no avail. Nevertheless, Stoutland enjoyed a significant role during its time in OU. As for Stoutland's Sandless Adventures, well, there wasn't much to them. When it wasn't abusing Sand, it didn't stand out among the plethora of normal type attackers that comprised its competition, and was unable to find a niche even all the way down in NU. Still, not a bad price to pay for UU domination, and a strong niche for a time in OU. And so Stoutland had a great debut generation. Sandstream's effect no longer being permanent meant Excadrill was no longer broken in OU, meaning Stoutland wouldn't be able to reprise any sort of niche there. In UU though, that was a different story. Sure, lack of permanent sand duration was a significant hindrance, but it was worth making Stoutland work, as it had also received an incredible buff in Generation 6. Its base attack, formerly a respectable 100, was now a beastly 110, making its already devastating returns utterly monstrous. Stoutland once again teamed up with its pal Hapaudon. The two had to work more closely in tandem, as Stoutland had to pick its spots more carefully, but the rewards were huge, and with solid play, it was still plenty capable of cleaning teams up late game. Stoutland also loved partnering with another offensive terror that was also a fixture of sand teams, Mega Aerodactyl. The two formed one of the most ferocious offensive duels in the metagame, and their prowess really allowed Sand to start taking off, especially when Oras came around. Sadly, some time into Oras, Hippowdon's OU excellence was recognized by enough players for his usage to rise it out of UU, and that ended Stoutland's time in the tier. So the question was, was Stoutland going to repeat the trajectory of his debut generation? Once the Sand disappeared, so did it, and the answer was, nope. Generation 6 introduced a new lowest tier, PU, and Stoutland fit in perfectly there. It absolutely destroyed the entire tier. Its choice band return was arguably the most dangerous attack in the tier, chunking even resists, and thanks to Stoutland's scrappy ability, it completely ignored ghost types would-be immunity, making it even more insanely spammable. Its coverage and power also meant even bulky resists weren't exactly safe, especially since Stoutland got so many opportunities to hit the field thanks to Vault Switch support from the similarly excellent on Frost. They were a ferocious offensive combination, but that's not surprising as they were the two best Pokemon in the tier. Yes, you heard right. For its unmatched brutal efficiency in this manually and demolishing the metagame, Stoutland was a top two Pokemon in Oras PU. To make things even better, its natural bulk was great. This not only let it brawl effectively with weak defensive Pokemon if push came to shove, but let it take a hit from many opposing offensive Pokemon as well, which gave it plenty of flexibility to how it could wreak havoc. It didn't necessarily have to run scrappy either. It could pair up with Hippopotas and use Sand Rush to bowl over teams even more easily. It wasn't just good for late game cleaning either. Offensive teams' response to Stoutland was usually to sacrifice something, then respond with a faster Pokemon like Floatzel or a Choice Scarfer. But in Sand, that wasn't an option, and Stoutland could quickly spiral out of control. Bulkier teams still weren't exactly safe either, and it's not like Ghost types actually being able to use their normal immunity was too much of a problem. They still had the fear of Arceus put in them by Stoutland's vicious crunch. Stoutland defined much of what offense was in Oras PU and shaped much of the tier as a result. For instance, the main thing that made defensive Mawile good was that it was by far the best answer to Stoutland and not much else. So all in all, Stoutland made PU its own, capping off another excellent generation for it. 
Stoutland's reliance on sand would no longer be tied to the Hippopotas line, as Gigalith gained Sandstream in Generation 7. As usual, it mercilessly bowled over frailer offensive teams. Its main issue was that the RU tier was naturally very physically bulky, and frailer offensive teams were not too popular. Even many offense teams had plenty of physical backbone without even trying. Populated as they were by top tier Pokemon like Metagross, Mega Blastoise, Donphan, and Nidoqueen, to say nothing of popular bulkier options like Registeel, Mandibuzz, Slowbro, and Bronzong. Nevertheless, Stoutland always posed a threat. It required a lot of support and chip damage to get some progress going against such teams, but it wasn't anything unreasonable. One just had to throw down spikes and pack a strong pursuit, and the rewards were immense. As once Stoutland was in position, there was little scarier. Dedicated sand teams and thereby Stoutland were specific, but their niche in RU was legitimate. Meanwhile, Sandless Stoutland returned to PU, which had suffered immense power creep. It had excellent normal type competition in Kangaskhan and a seriously buffed Dodrio. Both were significantly faster than Stoutland. Additionally, the metagame was much bulkier. Regirock was a premier physical wall. So what did this mean for Stoutland? Was it finally out of luck? Nope. In the face of this excellent competition and this bulkier metagame, Stoutland not only found the niche, but thrived. It wasn't just technically usable, it was genuinely great. Stoutland was much stronger than Kangaskhan, who had to use Double Edge as its normal stat to compensate, though with the significant drawback of recoil cutting into its own bulk. Stoutland had no such issues. Stoutland had the same attack stat as Dodrio, but Dodrio hit harder thanks to Brave Bird's additional 18 base power over return, even when using a Jolly Nature as opposed to Stoutland's Adam. However, if the Stealth Rock neutral, naturally bulky Kangaskhan was hampered by its own attacking recoil, just imagine how inept the Stealth Rock weak, naturally frail Dodrio was. Plus, Stoutland still hit hard. It had the perfect blend of threatening the opponent with huge damage while maintaining its own longevity and respectable bulk, which was crucial for longer games. This allowed it to actually threaten Regirock in the long run, for example, while being able to take hits in a pinch. The speed difference between Stoutland and the other two was significant, but Stoutland still effortlessly got the jump on much in the metagame, which was in large part quite slow. It was barely even a disadvantage. Stoutland was among the best options in the tier for feasting on the bulky cores that populated it. It switched into Jellicent's Will-O-Wisp and began firing off utterly ruinous facade. Kangaskhan could also technically do this, since it also had Scrafty, but it lacked Stoutland's sheer power. Once again, Stoutland was an absolutely excellent Pokemon in PU, capping off another great generation for it. Stoutland was brutally nerfed to the point of unviability in Generation 8. That pained us to say, so we had to say it quickly and without warning, like unexpectedly ripping off a band-aid. For some reason, Sword and Shield removed Return from the game, thereby ridding Stoutland of its long-standing stab, and it has no real alternative. Facade just isn't the same. It doesn't have Double Edge, it doesn't even have Body Slam, and it can't really threaten Pokemon like it could before. Lower tier Sand Rush duty was thus entirely relegated to the likes of Lycanroc and Sand Slash, who had been fortunate enough to not have their stab moves deleted from the game. Game Freaks committed many offenses before, but to wrong Stoutland like this and not even give it double edge or something to make up for it? That was just awful. If it still had returned, Stoutland would have almost surely racked up another great generation, but it was robbed. And so Stoutland sadly sank from superb to untiered in the blink of an eye. And that's it, so how good was Stoutland actually? Well, ever since its debut generation, it's made a name for itself as a Sand Rush abuser. It was so good that it was responsible for Sand as a whole being banned from Yu Yu in its debut generation, even when being supported by Hippopotas. Then it went to OU and made a significant splash there as well. Now it wasn't worth much outside of Sand abuse, until the next generation, where one PU tier and 10 extra base attack later, it came to define the tier. That base attack buff was one of Game Freak's kindest moments. It was similar excellent in the seventh generation and then was inexplicably ruined by one of game freak's most heinous acts making the eighth generation a complete non-factor for it maybe they thought they had to balance out the nice thing they had done a couple generations prior or something regardless stoutland has had an excellent thoroughly unique competitive career one completely befitting of such a good dog thanks for watching everyone and thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and for voting for this pokemon for this month's patron pick
And if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False White Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know, what do you think about competitive Stoutland? Aside from giving it double edge, what else would you give it to have it appear in a Sword and Shield meta? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.